Game on Inferno Shrines, everybody. We have Team Dino against Team Masquerade as Banshee Cup season number two continues. Well, and with another best of threes right in front of us, let's talk a little bit about the tournament. So, as explained, we have again for the second season $2,500 in prize money. Thanks to Psykiff, thanks to Kevin. In case if you're by now still not familiar with him, he's the one that owns the land center in Miami where we had now multiple offline events. He also financed the offline event in uh, Berlin, the Nations Cup. If you haven't watched that yet, I would highly, highly recommend that you check out the playlist on the YouTube channel. By far the best Heroes of the Storm tournament that we had in the past 7-8 years. So if you haven't watched it yet, check it out. You can thank me later. But big shout out to Kevin. Thanks for also making this tournament here possible. Banshee Cup is named after his one trick, after the Banshee Queen Sylvanas. And we split the prize pool this time. So from the $2,500 of prize money, $1,500 go to the top three teams, just like you would have in any other tournament as well. But the remaining $1,000, they go into the bounty pool. So we introduced bounties in season one, and you can see them here for the second season. We adjusted a little bit. And we took the feedback from season number one. We wanted to experiment with the system a little bit and just with the idea of having bounties, having incentives for players and teams to play certain things that we would love to see in games. And we adjusted the way that we dealt with them. So what we have now is not that you get a fixed amount per bounty completed, but now every bounty that you complete will give you a ticket for the bounty pool, for your share of the bounty pool. So right now, if you have, for example, three teams and each team completed one bounty, then what happens is if the tournament ends and those are the only bounties that are completed, each team will get $333 out of that pool. If one team completes more bounties, they get a higher share and so on and so forth. So it incentivizes players and teams to go for a bit of a risk reward calculation to see, okay, can we incorporate some of these strategies? Can we give ourselves a handicap doing that? And then maybe, you know, get some extra money out of it. And specifically when there's only a few teams that completed bounties, your incentive is obviously higher because you're getting a bigger share out of the pool. And if you have an opponent that then tries to play a bounty against you, you have a bigger incentive to take him down there because you want to make sure that they A, lose the game, that you win the series, but you also want to make sure that they don't get another ticket for that pool so it's a pretty cool system it's absolutely optional players aren't forced to do any of this but it is an incentive and it is something that can create some fun games there as you might have seen already looking at the list a few of them are a bit easier to accomplish than others that's by design they're not supposed to be all on the same level and we'll see what we get we had quite a few bounties already completed a lot of fun there was also a lot of bounty attempts that backfired but it's just cool to see those matches in general now, when we're talking about the teams, we also have a captain's draft for the second season of the Banshee Cup, meaning that players could sign up individually. You didn't have to sign up as a team for this tournament. The player pool, which consisted of around 100, 110 players, if I'm not mistaken, they voted then on, on eight captains, and then those eight captains then drafted their teams out of that player pool. And now in our first phase, we have a full round robin that is being played out here. Team Masquerade, so far, with actually not a lot of luck, they have not won a single series yet, so they are in dire need of a bit of a victory. And Team Dino has fared a bit better up to this point, but we'll see what they can do here today. If they can lock in another W, or if Team Masquerade finally gets a win. Now the red team has actually gotten multiple wins on maps, but they haven't decided an entire series in their favor. And some of them were pretty close. I mean, at times it was literally just on the last few minutes of a game that it was completely flipped around. Now we're heading into Infernal Shrines, and we already have Mayev and Stukov taken on the side of Dino and his boys, playing with Hyde again. So they have Koreans that are playing for them. And I have to highlight, while we're talking about Team Masquerade, again, Commander Rex and his Vala. Part of it is because I've been for the longest time, as I could still do it, Vala one trick. Then at some point, uh, after I think it was the beta was finished, the game released, and one or two years went in, everybody started to jump more heavily on damage dealers, and then you were forced to play either tank or side laner. So I haven't seen that many Vala games since. She also fell off the meta train at some point. But Vala was my original love in Heroes of the Storm, so I have still a sweet spot for her. And Commander Rex has a pretty mean auto-attack Vala that he has fired out multiple times already. 
Don't think that he necessarily is gonna bust her out here, but during the series we could definitely still get to see her. They started things off with Sylvanas on the red team side, which is of course nice if you can push with the Punisher, for example, on Inferno Shrine. There's Mephisto. We get Blaze on top of it to round out the draft. So pretty solid one already for Inferno. Diablo to bully people around, bounce them into walls. Blaze for follow-up stun, the bunker if you need it. And we still need the main tank on the side of Team Dino. So blue team as we're getting ready for map number one we have gray main for the captain himself for dino and he already played some fantastic gray main games in this tournament here comes Crankle with muradin and with that we're set let's head straight into map number one in Fano shrines game number one on the left in blue we have dino on gray main the captain going for the damage jaden on my f Crankle is playing muradin in our first game of the match Danazovsky on Stukov and Hyde is playing Leoric. To the right side of the map, Team Masquerade. Well, they need a win. We got Mopsio on Diablo, Commander Rex on Mephisto today. Valar with Hyper Shift on level 1 is playing Brightwing. We have Masquerade on Sylvanas with the might of the Banshee Queen. And last but not least, Yasu on the side lane, rocking Blaze as we are going into the first game of the series. So, what exactly can Team Masquerade do here today? Are they finally going to be able to take a match or are they going to be in trouble again? Now, just a quick reminder, if you are actually ranking last in the uh, round robin in the standings, you're not out of the tournament, you're not getting eliminated but you will have a much, much harder time when we're going into the group stage. So there are quite a lot of advantages when you're placing high in uh, the ranking. Not only do you get easier groups and you can pick your first opponent, but at the same time it's also about getting in your matches not only first pick but also map choice for the first map. So it's quite a leg up if you are able to establish yourself very high in the standings, specifically if you're making it into the top four going to be a lot easier for you to have a chance to make it through the groups so for masquerade and his boys it's kind of important to at least get a few wins so that they can establish themselves let's say in the middle of the pack here uh, on the other hand we have teams like the one around banana age that have been doing absolutely fantastic it's one of the cool things about running a captain's draft that you just don't know at the beginning which teams will vibe properly and will be able to do well so there is a certain amount of well, <laughs> for just a second, I thought he might be a bit too late on that camp. <laughs> there is a certain element of just guesswork and seeing, okay, who does well, who drafted a good team, and who is able to really make this work. And you can obviously, as you continue to play together through the weeks, start to improve and then at some point think maybe you change your shot caller or whatever. But in this case, Dino and his boys are doing a little bit better in the early game. Moving in with five to get the first kill and taking Mephisto down. So he's already eliminated here immediately. Two kills to zero. Level four is in play. We're now getting eyes in the dark from Greymane and a bit of damage done at the bottom of the map where Greymane can shine again in Worgen form. All those auto attacks and bam, the entire wall is gone and Brightwing gets attacked and gets killed. The Fruit Fly gets eliminated, so Trashwing is down. And the blue team is on a warpath here, trying to make a statement in game number one immediately. Uh, definitely not kidding around here, so a really nice start into this. Doing a little bit of work, we have three kills to zero now. And this also results in them having a pretty significant lead in, uh, uh, in experience. I mean, they're doing pretty well. So, yeah, they're actually doing pretty well at this point with all the action. Now that we are looking all the way up to the top left, we have the camp started up. Three kills to zero will allow the blue team to also take the early level seven for the shrine with the camp that they're currently claiming. If they're the only ones to take one, and it seems like that's exactly what we're getting, they could theoretically push through the top lane as well. So, time will tell. But, yeah, with that... 16 stacks. They're trying to get damage done with Sylvanas at the bottom of the map. They completely abandoned the idea to go for objective number one. We've seen that strategy executed a few times already, of course. Team Lopaka has also done something similar on multiple occasions. So they are trying to get structural damage where and abandon the objective. Trying to get enough done with that. And they're getting a kill on Greymane too. Leo Hyde is about to get the Punisher for the team. But the wall gets destroyed down at the bottom of the map. So, yep, nicely done. 
Blaze at the top, on the other hand, gets also caught. So it's four kills to one overall right now. And yeah, it's an interesting back and forth there. So not too shabby. Uh, let's see. At this point, at the bottom of the map, the attack is coming in. And can they take that forward out with Sylvanas? It seems like they can. And it's a question of what the blue team can do in the middle of the map as they're moving in with the Punisher. But even the four down here survive for another moment. They're not trying to take the minions out though. And those finish the job, take it on. But the Stormbolt hits hard. And Brightwing goes down again. Voila, eliminated. They go for Mephisto and get another kill. Six kills to one. Job well done here. And still a bit of an attack down at the bottom of the map as they are trying for another one. Masquerade is the next one to receive the Stormbolt straight to the face. Not only making the blue team happy, but also Sylvanas' dentist. That's another four destroyed. And in the middle, we have the Punisher destroying the first one. So it Lots of action right now. Three forts destroyed at the five minute mark. That's where we're at right now. Five minutes in and three forts are gone. The strategy backfired a little bit that Team Masquerade wanted to play for here. They wanted to go for that push strategy as I explained earlier where they abandon the objective but still try to do structural damage to then try and defend uh, against the Punisher. It backfired because the blue team rotated over, flanked in and started to take them out. But now we have level 10 with a big lead in experience for the blue team. Seven kills, two, one. Level 10 is locked in. We have them with Haymaker as well as Crankle is looking to make some plays with it. And even a push now down at the bottom of the map as they're trying to go for the next one here. So, yeah, could do some damage right there now at the wall towards the keep and open that up for later on in the game, particularly since the next Punisher the next shrine is spawning in the bot lane too, so the more damage you can do here, the more successful your next push is going to be. Always assuming that you can take the objective. Since they have level 10, there's very little that Team Masquerade can do about it right now, so they have to essentially just check this out, be like, yeah, well, let's try and just posture, slow them down a little bit, get level 10 and then fight back. But they had to make it happen until then. Yep, Yazu. Some assistance from Brightwing. Level 10 is now ready for both sides. We get Lightning Breath for Diablo, for Mopsio. And we have Mephisto with the Durance of A. At least even talents now. Team Masquerade, they got their level 10. They can now fight back. Hide, hiding in the bush. And it's just making sure that he's not falling into any traps of the red team. But we have also, by the way, for Stukov, we have him with reactive Ballistospores here, going into the vigorous uptake and then the targeted excision. And uh, he's starting through with this. And of course, the Arnogon going to try and force that fight here. No talent advantage, but still the idea of going straight in for Masquerade, for example. Mirrodin went deep, gets the Haymaker out, but also Durance of Hate hits hard. Crankle in trouble, went maybe a bit too deep on this one, is able to get out, which is honestly pretty impressive here. I already thought that he went too far and would pay the price for it, but he's still able to get out. Hyde is trying to escape. The entire team in blue is struggling, but they still have a fountain right there that they could now use and tap, which is exactly what they're doing. Donozovsky low, but still alive. And it is finally Mayev that dies first in this fight. So Team Masquerade making a bit of a play and doing a move to get farther towards level 13 because that's the next talent that the blue team is not going to pick up any moment. And as I said before, it is happening at a time when we have the Shrine popping up. Big drain from Hyde as he easily moves out here. The red team is starting up on the Shrine and look at that, they're going for the fort at the top. They want Brightwing who jumps out and the Stormbolt misses. Nicely done by Blaze as well. A bit of extra damage from Dino, but the red team rotated over in force so they didn't leave anybody on the shrine trying to go for the minions in the objective. And that leads to Danazovsky falling. Level 13 is ready. They have the talent advantage now, but they're down one hero. Now, they are getting with height quite a lot of minion stacks and the attempt to slow the red team down on their rotation towards the objective allows Leoric to get a few more minions for the team. So they have 21-2-1. One, one. Height moving out. Oh, nearly dying here. Might still die and does as Sylvanas comes in, gets met with a disc, but it's too late. So that is Leoric falling. He'll be back in uh, very short order. 
Stukov is making his way over as well. 21 stacks to 13. The fight is still on. Krankel, keep in mind, doesn't have Avatar. And he dies as a result. They're really starting to feed their heroes one by one into the red team. And that brings Team Masquerade easily back into the game. And they are about to grab this objective. Objective number two, the Arcane Punisher, will likely go over to Team Masquerade. So they got their act together. They were struggling at the beginning. Maybe not quite woken up just yet. And now they're doing much, much better here. At least the camp is claimed by the blue team as they're starting to push towards the, towards the top. Obviously attempting to make sure that they are starting to do the thing here. And in the meantime, we're having in the middle our thing done. So, yeah. But yeah, either way. Right now, what we're getting is the push through the middle. Seven kills, two five. And the wall is about to be destroyed. Top side is defended by Blaze. The red team has to, of course, make sure that the camp is not doing too much work there. We have Rayman defending the bottom of the map. And it honestly doesn't really seem like Team Masquerade is getting a whole lot out of that objective. Dino has easily taken the Punisher out. So now it's seven kills to five with level 16 coming up next for the blue team. They still maintain a bit of a lead here. And the attack is currently coming towards the top side. So teams are always beelining over to another structure. The entire game has been like this, where it's always just trying to feign out the opponent a little bit and yeah, go for attacks towards structures. We're 10 minutes in and we have essentially only two forts left on the map. One for the blue team, one for uh, their opponents. And it's an interesting way to play this. <laughs> it's kind of entertaining though. Always a little bit of action, always a bit more going on here as we have another lock against Diablo. They're trying to go for Mopsio. Nice stun into the wall as my F is trying to have a piece of the action. Ah, but Leo still dies. Went for the lightning breath here and was starting to make a move but couldn't quite get enough damage out to kill anyone. Instead, Diablo gone. He lost his soul stacks. He himself, essentially still alive as you can see, but he lost the souls. Only maintained a few. So he only kept the 25 of the heroes of the Storm executives, of the Blizzard executives, that just don't deserve to be released. Everybody else was let go and he has to recover a few more. But yeah, the attack is still coming in and we'll see how much more they can actually do at this point. Because right now we have still a disadvantage. Still a disadvantage for the red team. So, over on the left, Yaz is trying to escape. He could essentially be caught, but that's not the case. Danazovsky also super low. So with both teams now in level 16 talents, it starts to even out more and more as all of this continues. I mean, right now we got debilitating flames, we got lightning uh, reaction. We have also the thermal protection for Blaze as they're locking in the level 16 talents. And of course, last but not least, we have Critterize here for Brightwing. But essentially what we're getting is a much more even game than what it looked like initially. On the damage side, we have 40,000 off from Sylvanas. We have 31,000 from Greymane. So Sylvana is easily the top damage dealer in the game at this point. Playing a pretty solid one. Blue team again going for a camp. The red team stopping them in their tracks. Leo is rotating in from the top to make it an even battle in a 5 versus 5. But they're already going for Muradin. And Krankel does not have Avatar. And he is paying the price for it. Without that layer of protection, he goes down. They kill Mephisto. They push Diablo out of the fight, turning it into a 4 versus 3 for just a couple of seconds. Attempting to get another kill. Blaze a bit low. Yazu. Can they tether? Can they stun? They're looking for it, but they can't pull it off. Mopsio, on the other hand, gets caught by the Entomb. And they want to go for Diablo, but they can't. They're pushing Masquerade back on Sylvanas, and Mopsio is finally being targeted. And that's going to be the end of Diablo. And this time, he's down for the count. So it gets completely annihilated. 10 kills, 2-6. Still at one level lead, and the objective is now up at the top. And talking about the top lane, we have a camp that is starting to break through this slowly and steadily here. Uh, right. And, well, let's see what they can do on this one. They have to defeat this, they have to go for the shrines. There are still a couple of things that they have to do here in order to maybe get to level 20 with an objective and then move through the top lane which has to be the goal here, of course. So we'll see if they can pull it off. The timing could honestly just work out for them. This could actually be perfect for them and think about it. They are nearly on level 19. If they delay the objective a little bit, keep it at 39 stacks, for example, they could propel it forward towards Storm Talents. 
The fight down here might help them to get even more XP, specifically with now Sylvanas falling. They're trying to go for Brightwing. 37, 39. Is he going to lock the objective in? Or is he delaying things? He gets it. Frozen Punisher. They're taking Brightwing down. They go for the Frozen Punisher. They're nearly on level 19 and a half. And with the Frozen Punisher alone, the topside fort will, of course, fall. The question is simply, can they go for the keep as well? That has to be the goal at this point in time. But really nice kills for Team Dino on this first map of the best of three series. We have Brightwing and Sylvanas down. Sylvanas can now help with the push at the top pretty easily. Greyman is defeating the camp in the middle of the map. And the top side fort is about to be taken as the team gets level 20. That gives us the upgrade on Leo's and Tomb. Buried Alive is now in play. We have the Hunter's Blunderbuss. We're getting top off. And we now also get the Hardened Shield for Murden. Obviously compensating a bit for the lack of Avatar on level 10. Number kills on 6. Now another quick move being made by Hyde. But he falls. Leoki activating the trade as the fight comes through. And <laughs> losing Murden and Greyman within seconds. The rest of the team is on the run. And this fight fired quickly. Huge problems now for Team Dino. That definitely did not go as intended. All they got out of the Punisher is essentially a fort. And that is definitely not worth it. That's something that they could have taken with... Careful. With Greymane alone. Masquerade just barely misses out on this. But, yep, that was a big, big defense from Team Masquerade. And they're nearly on level 20 now. So, yeah, just look at this. They were so damn good with it. A bit too, mu too much aggression, honestly. Too much aggression from the blue team. They got punished for it. And now they're facing off against the Sylvanas push through the top lane. And it's going to cost them one of their keeps. The core, I just don't see a way for Team Masquerade to finish the game here. But they can take the keep out, and that in and of itself is already a win. Because now, they are ahead in structures. I mean, granted, there's still a fort in the middle, standing for the blue team. But if you're losing a keep, that's obviously worth a lot more. At the bottom of the map, in the meantime, we have some catapults starting to push in. That's going to at least take a tower down. It might even scratch the paint on the bottom keep just a little bit. Uh, but yeah, so the tower is definitely gonna fall. We're 16 minutes in, so the catapults, they hurt, not too much. Oh, and hello. Mayev gets killed? And they're going for Greyman? That was a nice haymaker. <laughs> that was actually a really nice haymaker. <laughs> Krankel creating some space for his teammates, making sure that Greyman doesn't get caught and killed after he was hit by Durance of Hate here. As the red team is moving through the mid lane at the bottom of the map, the keep is now under pressure. Catapults are there just in time to home in on the keep itself. But quick reminder, Team Dainu has already lost one. And now it's 12 kills to 11. So Team Masquerade has more than made up for the kill deficit that they were running earlier. They're catching up super quickly and might even surpass the blue team if they're able to farm Leorki again, for example. So they're trying to go for keep number two. It's a really insane back and forth now. Really cool moves made by Team Masquerade and it allows them to uh, go to a really good spot in the game with level 21 now for both teams. The keep at the bot lane has taken some damage on the right side as I already explained and up at the top lane we have also damage done but none of these have been taken out yet. And Dino's team is all of a sudden struggling. Dino's team is all of a sudden looking at this they're like Team, we might have a bit of a problem. So, yep. Bit crazy. Yeah, I'm a little bit curious how exactly this is going to pan out now for Dino's team. They were dominating this. Absolutely dominating it. And now they're essentially getting farmed. Diablo went into the Lord of Terror on level 20. We have Sylvanas with a withering barrage. And, of course, Mimic for Mephisto talking about Mephisto, he's sitting at 40,000 damage. Nothing insane, but if you're looking over to Greyman and Sylvanas, they're basically on the exact same damage amount here. They're very, very similar. And the attack in the middle once again. Diablo gets attacked, gets drained, gets this. They're shutting down the lightning breath as they're trying to move out of the fight. A lot of cooldowns already burned here, but for example, Mephisto and Sylvanas are still holding back their ults. We have Crankle with Muradin looking for the Stormball target. Doesn't connect it. It's all about the Shrine right now. And of course the camp that is pushing through the top lane for the core. There's three catapults on that lane already. They're trying to catch Blaze. He has no bunker left, but they cannot make the connect. And the top lane is going to be a problem for Team Dino. They're having a huge issue there. 
Diablo gets caught. He's fully stacked on souls. Is gonna fall in a moment. But Leo already died. And Diablo will be back in a few seconds. With Mayev gone, this is not looking good for the blue team. There's two catapults already on the core. A third one is moving in. The shield is about to be lost. And it does not look like Team Dino is going to be able to take this one. They are losing hit points on the core. They're losing them quickly. The Winions are starting to do work. And Team Masquerade wants the objective. 56%, 50% on the blue team score. And now with Murden dying again, this looks like it's going to be lights out. The catapults are defeated, but the core is down to 30%. That's just not going to be enough. Murden got killed four times now in total, and Team Masquerade isn't even wasting any more time on the objective, even with the 38 stacks that they have. Instead, they're trying to go for the core to finish it all here. And who's going to stop them? Only three survivors. They're targeting Hyde, they're targeting Leoric as they're starting to make a move here. Mopsio is moving forward. Lightning Breath is out, and Team Masquerade turned the table on the blue team and is able to lock in the W on Infernal Shrines. Nicely done, the red team with the first victory in the best of three, GG. Before we head into game number two, make sure that you subscribe to the channel if you haven't done it yet, so you don't miss out on any future content here on Calder TV. Map number two, Battlefield of Eternity. Locked in mega quickly from Team Dino. First pick, first ban goes... To, uh, sorry, from Team Masquerade. First pick, first ban goes over to Team Dino. But Team Masquerade locked in uh, their map very, very quickly here. So, let's see what we're getting. We have Hogger already banned out. Question, of course, is what are we getting as damage dealers? You still have Hanzo up, which would be a fantastic hero to play on Battlefield of Eternity. Vala with an arrow build. Quick reminder that we have seen also Vala with an auto attack style multiple times already on Battlefield of Eternity. In that case, you're more so looking for the team fights than anything else. And with that in mind, I come back to Commander Rex. Keep that at least in the back of your head because it is an option. You can either play it with auto attack, you can go for arrow. So unless Vala gets banned, I would expect her to be played here. And we have also a few more heroes that usually shine on Battlefield. That would be Greymane, Sylvanas, but those have been played already. And hero can only heroes can only be played once within a series. So though, so those are actually not there anymore. But all right, uh, bu -bu -bu -bu, we have Tracer band out as well. And there is Hanzo, first pick. Nicely done. So, first pick is immediately in with Hanzo. Again, he's one of the top damage dealers when you're talking about Battlefield of Eternity. So this is not really a shock that they are going for him. I feel at least... I, I should point out Sergeant Hammer. She's been banned... Uh, sorry, she's been picked... Well, and banned. A couple of times now in Battlefield of Eternity as well. Kind of goes through phases where teams absolutely ignore her on Battlefield. And then she comes back into the mix. I don't expect to see her here. But just so that we have the entire... Spectrum covered. Anduin and Chromie, so Team Blondie for now, over on Team Masquerade. And again, Team Masquerade hasn't won a single match yet. They are ahead now with a 1-0. They were in this position already a few times and then lost the series. Dino's team is going to do everything that they can in order to turn this around and win two in a row. But for Masquerade's team, it would be really important to lock in a best of three victory. A 2-0 would go a long way. Can they pull that off? Well, I guess we're going to find out on Battlefield of Eternity now. We have Liming and Dehaka. And yeah, there we go. Liming, Dehaka, nice poke, not only from Hanzo, but also from Liming herself. And then on top of that, we're getting uh, on the bands Jojo eliminated. So Crankle can't rely on her. That's two tanks that are now out. Both. <laughs> Both in Uberag and uh, and Johanna, but the ban against Genji makes a whole lot of sense. You have Anduin already against you, so oftentimes you're starting with the uh, with the Genji pick, and then Anduin gets banned so that you don't have the light bomb engage. In this case, it's the opposite. They prioritized Anduin, but it's still something where the blue team said, "Okay, we're going to deny them the combo, and we're going to make sure that they're not running this with both of them." So yeah, Chromie is the only damage here, and we get Alarak. Alarak gets played. Okay. And we have Garrosh. Okay. Nice. I, I like myself a good Alarak game. Just to make this clear, Alarak is not a bounty. So, yes, Alarak is not a bounty. We actually thought about making Alarak a bounty, decided against it, because he gets a decent amount of play on Battlefield of Eternity. And, yeah. 
decided against making him a bounty too. Especially since some of the players really have a bit of an affinity for him that would make things way too easy. Tyrande and Margan is the final two picks now on the blue team side. So we have them with Tyrande's heals also getting her trade off against the Immortal and against stun targets. Samuro is the final one on uh, the red team side, so triple frontline, so to say, with Samuro running in the side lane. It's a pretty neat draft here. I think it's going to be a spicy game. Battlefield of Eternity, map number two, everyone, so let's get ready. Team Masquerade against Team Dino. Game on! Dino's team on the left with the man himself on Li Ming, getting the poke damage out. We have Danazovsky on Taranda, Hyde on the Haka, playing as usual the side laner for the team. Jaden on Hanzo. And Krankel is playing Malganis as on the right side their opponents start things off with Masquerade playing Alarak. We have Commander Rex on Chromie, Valar on Anduin, Yasu is playing Samoro, and we're getting Mopsio on Garrosh. Samoro starting things with Way of the Wind as his level 1 talent choice. Alarak is moving into overwhelming power, so unfortunately, we're not getting the negatively charged build where you can start stacking it up on level 4. But we are still going to keep our eye on Sadism, for example. As Yasuo is slowly going to make his way over to the top lane. I mean, everybody's just checking here in the middle of the map. Is there maybe somebody, you know, that they can fight? As anybody that is trying to make a nice, easy beeline for a tower to try and take that out, even without Sylvanas. But the poke is happening from Dainu as he's starting to YOLO some of his combos out against structures on the top side. Yasu finds himself in a 1 versus 2, but gets some assistance from Alarak now any moment. As they are going for a 3-2 split for once. Not something that you are seeing all the time, but then at the same time it happens every now and then. But Alarak is already moving down to the bottom of the map. So they want to maintain that four-man bot lane that you usually see when we're talking about Battlefield of Eternity. <laughs> There's a combo in the making right there. Ah, he, he thought he would be here and just missed it. I still like the move. I still like it. It was a pretty cool move and a nice idea and it could have worked out. You had pretty much two options in that bush and if you hit it right there, you can walk away with some easy free damage against your opponent. They're still making a play, but of course it's Anduin that gets isolated. Valar in trouble, and he's down. Anduin is eliminated. First kill in the game. Team Dino opens map number two up with a quick kill against the Crybaby. So that was pretty sweet. And with the five man that they have at the bottom of the map, everybody rotating over from the top lane. They can now go for the camp claim that as well and start crashing the bot lane a bit more. Good flip though from Mopsio and it might be the end of Crankle. Yeah, he gets away. Really nice juke from him, making sure that he is able to escape. So nicely done. And Samuro is still up at the top. I'm very surprised honestly that we haven't seen more Samuro plays. Basically because Samuro was played a whole lot more in the first season of the Banshee Cup without a bounty on him. So it's kind of surprising to me that we haven't seen him more often. I think it's partly also because the teams have started to swap some of the roles around slightly and some of the players that we typically see on Samoro have not been chosen by the captains and are therefore not playing in the tournament right now. Could of course always come in as a sub player if somebody is needed. If a team is not able to get all five core players onto a play day. But right now, what we're getting is a fairly even start into objective number one between the two teams, with Dino and Masquerade just barely on the same level. I mean, the, the advantage for the blue team is absolutely tiny. Samuro could make a difference at the top as he's coming through with this, but for now, we're having just pressure on the red team's immortal. The fight already starting off though. Tyrande a little bit far to front. Chromie trying to take advantage of it. It looks for the kill as Danazovsky is low, but is able to get away. Pretty impressive escape here. Instead, it's Yasuo that gets caught and Samuro falls. The second kill for Team Dainu as they're not only doing damage to the immortal, but also claim another kill. Job well done. Real nice moves by the team in blue now. And again, they are hoping to win two in a row at this point. They're definitely going to win the first objective, I can tell you that much. There's absolutely no denying or counterplaying that anymore. First objective is going to be taken 100% by the blue team. 
And then the question remains, how much damage can they do with that? Can they only break through that gate at the top lane, or will they also be able to take the fort out? They can lock in another kill, that would of course be great. Tanozovsky is gonna wait for that Hunter's Mark once more, but we already are seeing a very strong posture up at the front from the red team as they're attempting to defend this. The Haka could always come through towards the top and make this a 5 versus 4 if he wanted to. They have the level 7 advantage, which now gives the Ming also Calamity for the extra damage. And we get Danazovsky with the Hunter's Fury for Tyrande. Gate is gone within seconds. Immortal switches over into melee mode once the shield is gone. And with Alarak trying the combo, the stuns come out against Mopsio. They're trying to apply some pressure here. And they're taking the fallout, yeah? The entire fight is centered around the location and now the fort is gone. So that's a very successful first objective for Team Dino. Fort destroyed and the Immortal is even moving far forward. Start oh, ho, 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 Alarak <laughs> disappeared. The link against Mopsio and that's the second kill. Masquerade and Mopsio both get murdered and the top side tower, the first one, is about to fall as well. Nicely done. Team Dino not only able to take apart the top fort, but then even a tower and getting two more kills, which extends the leading experience to nearly a level. Very, very successful push from them. And a huge setback already for Team Masquerade. In all fairness, we should acknowledge that in game number one, it looked very similar. The early level 10 for the blue team was happening with, what was it, a one and a half level advantage. And then Team Masquerade turned it around in the early mid game. Now we're seeing something similar maybe even happening at the bottom of the map as uh, the Haka gets killed. That's the first kill, by the way, for the red team. And Chromie is therefore able to lock in her ult with Temporal Loop. So maybe another chance to set a kill up for the team here as they're slowly starting to move in. It would be kind of interesting to see them pull off the same trick twice if they can go for two comebacks, not only in game number one, but then also game number two. If they are able to pull that off, that's a very different question, but hey, time will tell. So, let's see. At the top, we're having Yasu still defending. Again, he's totally solo on the top lane, doing his thing here. The four-man at the bottom of the map is still fighting tooth and nail for every single inch of the map. As the objective gets announced, we have the blue team inching closer towards level 10, which will allow them to get at least a free half time show. Because the gap in experience is still pretty significant, and the big problem for the red team is just simply that it's going to take them a while to get to rogue abilities. But they're still engaging in the middle of the map, trying to slow down the blue team a bit, keep them occupied here. They have to be just super careful because now that the rogue abilities are in play, they should not venture out too far. A Hanzo arrow at the wrong moment in time with a good follow-up would be their demise for sure. So what they're trying instead is to apply pressure at the bottom wall, take one of the towers down at least. Samuro still getting experience for them up at the top. And now that the halftime show is over, it seems like the blue team is going to get even more value. Yeah, they're still way ahead in, uh, in talents. So it's a small window that remains, but they still have to close that gap. And there's nothing to be done. Where the hell was that arrow supposed to go? <laughs> <laughs> Wrong direction, my friend. Somebody fat fingered hard. They still got the kill on Garrosh, and they're getting Anduina as well. So, yep, Garrosh and the Crybaby are both eliminated. Good for them, I suppose. But, yep, that could have backfired heavily there. Interesting arrow, on the other hand. Straight towards Florida. So, with that, then the kill's coming in. We now have, at the same time, the objective taken, and to make matters worse for the red team, not only did we lose two heroes, but we also have the objective claimed with a 100% shield. So that was a big one, right there. I mean, six kills to one, the push to the bottom of the map is going to yield at least a destroyed keep. Uh, sorry, a destroyed fort. Keep would be nice, but I think that's probably asking a bit too much. We have Alarak also with the deadly charge. So they're gonna go Deadly Charge together with a Light Bomb, from the looks of it. Which is pretty cool if you can sync it up nicely. But if they can get full value out of it, that's a very different question. One that we're going to answer pretty soon. Six kills to one, as already mentioned. The uh, fort will be destroyed. At least I think so. Here comes the Haka, hide from behind. Trying to go for Commander X. The arrow missing again. But they could go for Chromie. They're trying, but Crankle had to move out. Here comes Alarak with the combo. The fort is gone. Tarana with her ult. 
They want Masquerade, but Mopsio is there and saves his captain. So, well done. Half a level until 13. One tower down, both ports are gone. The outer ring of defense is obliterated. And Team Dino in a very, very solid spot right now. Reminds me a bit of game number one. I'm not going to call it before anything else happens. I mean, the last time that we had a game on Battle Battlefield of Eternity can flip on a dime. Can flip pretty quickly. Now, either way, it's so level 13 in a second. That extra talent will come in handy for the blue team, too. But I suppose that for the next objective, at least, we should have a situation in which both teams will run the same talent. And that's then the moment where Team Masquerade can start to make a bit of a comeback. That's where they are going to try and make that happen. Here's the lead in talents for Team Dino. That gives us also for, well, what do you mean, Illusionist. So that's always a nice one, a bit of added safety that she's going to get through that. There's still a few camps up on the map that teams have to fight for. And in the case of the bot lane, Masquerade is currently trying to ensure that they're not going to lose too much here. Defending against the mercenary camp that was claimed a bit earlier. And of course, on top of that, also trying to take that catapult out before it can become a nuisance and start to take structures down. Um, so, yeah. But, yeah, either way, I gotta be careful on this one now. Because at this point, what are we getting here? We're getting more pressure at the top. Gate destroyed. Objective announced. 20 seconds left. The Haka pushing at the bottom of the map. Also trying to take a few things out here. And doing his best. But the deal is still the same. Try and make sure that you're getting the objective. For the red team, it's trying at level 13 so that you can finally have a proper fight. And that's what they are claiming here. So now with even talents, this is their moment. This is the moment. There's a double camp at the bottom of the map, which is a bit of a problem for the blue team. You don't want to lose hit points on the keep if you can avoid it. But they have to now really put all of their eggs in one basket. They need to be successful here. If they don't take the objective, then at least get a few kills. Because if all that backfires, then trying to claw your way back into the game is going to be more than a bit tricky. Already a nice flip here before Crankle can become a problem. Arrow connects with the back this time, but only shuts them down for a second. Not able to do too much more there. We had Samoro attack the bot lane a little bit. Again, there is a double camp and Samura is now starting to deal with it. He has to. I mean, he has to go in. Because this is going to be way too tricky for that keep. But he also went Bladestorm and there's the kill on Melganis. Finally, Chromie able to hammer the target down. They're going for hide and the Haka is in trouble. There's the taunt and can they take him? They cannot. <laughs> hide survives. Masquerade launched the combo too early. The Harker was still underground. If he would have been a bit more patient there, then I think that second kill would have been inevitable. But it is still a 5 versus 4 for a few more seconds with Marganus gone. So the halftime show is still claimed by the red team, but maybe now an opportunity to get a little bit of headway here. That's what they need to try and do. I mean, they are starting to burn it down quickly. It's the best that they can do at this point. They're having it down to 50% of its HP, but they still need to re-engage in the fight and take this one as well. The catapult at the bottom of the map has still done damage to the keep. It's finally taken out by the minion wave, but with 128 Sadism, Alara can also start to get some decent damage out. It's currently sitting at 14,000. Top damage in the game is Li Ming with 29k, and then we have Chromi coming in second with 24,000. But they still need more, they need to do something here. And also, they're all of a sudden on the clock again. There's half a level until 16. There's a light bomb engage. Double gets the full combo and they still can't get a kill. Hanzo survives and then the triple kill as a counter. It's a triple baby and Chromie goes down to four heroes eliminated. Holy shit. That was rough. Look at this. That's how it started. They came in and then... Holy shit. Bam. Now Samoro dies too. That's a five-man team wipe. And the objective gets claimed by Team Dino. Looking fantastic. The engage initially with the light bomb Alarak just charging in was pretty cool. It looked awesome. But then it backfired so hard that they lost the entire team in the process. 
And damn, that hurt. 11 kills to 3. Level 16 and a half against level 15. Dino gets the camp at the bottom of the map. They're even, they're even delaying the objective a bit to allow everyone to go back, recharge hit points and mana, and claim the camps that are remaining. So this is going to be a big hit for the keeps, obviously. So, yeah. Pretty rough. Sadism also being reset for Alarak, which is another problem. They are going to get level 16 talents for the defense, I suppose. But boy, oh boy, that was something. I mean, honestly, check this out again. I I'm going to show it again. This one was pretty nasty. Uh, what a hell of a fight. Alarak engaged and tries to get out. And here comes the big stun, the old from Taranda. They're getting everything synced up here. And all of a sudden, it's just an utter disaster. Everybody dies, and that results in the push up at the top now. With level 16 on both sides, but the keep doesn't stand a chance, of course. The one at the bottom of the map has taken damage earlier. There's the arrow from Hanzo, the follow-up from Taranda. Alarak nearly dies, barely survives, but Hyde gets flipped into three towers and goes down. So with the Haka gone... Ooh, Samuro dies. Maybe they can still do some damage here. The core is down to 93%. And another combo from Li Ming also connects. So Dino is starting to poke this a little bit further. Wants to get some damage in. Alarak, light bomb engage attempt. But the dodge is ready. 88% on the core. They're starting to attack again over here. And there's the old from Tarando. They're aiming for Gromi. Can't take Commander Rex out. Anduin with heal after heal. But the core is now down to 75%. And while they cannot end the game here, they still are able to get the core down to 69%. Nice. Pretty successful push from Team Dino. And they're really in the driver's seat in this game now. I mean, absolutely. So, uh, with that... And, again, not a single fort has been destroyed on the blue team side. Not one. All the forts are still standing. Which is, of course, a massive problem right now. If you're in a situation where you haven't taken a single fort out and you're already losing keeps, you know that you are in for a tough time. And yeah, that's exactly what's happening here. So as it stands, we're now having a, a pretty interesting situation going on where the arrow is again missing hard, but while well, the arrow flies, we have still a fight that they were trying to force here. I mean, in an ideal world, what the team around Mopsio and Masquerade wants to do, of course, is force the battle now before level 20 and get a kill. And they get one, but they also lose some more in the process. At least they eliminated Li Ming, who is the top damage dealer in the game. So that might help them in the fight here. With the main damage gone, can they still turn it? They're trying for Jaden. Ah, but Masquerade dies on Alarak. And the fight turns against the red team once again. Once more, they are in trouble. And this could be the last objective if it gets claimed by the blue team. Yeah, it's a tough one for Team Masquerade. It seems like they have to mentally prepare themselves for game number three already. Because this is looking like a rough ride. Level 20 will be available 100% for Team Dino. Taranda has not died once. Great positional play for Danazovsky throughout all of it. Taranda is still quite weak when people can get on top of her. And giving the engage potential with Alarak in particular. Really nice job by Danazovsky. He keeping himself out of trouble. For now, we're also looking at level 20 talents, of course, which give us in this case the shooting star. And we also have the alone in the dark for Malganis. For poke against Mopsio. Once again, Danazovsky starting to come in. They're trying for Yazu, and he's dead. Samuro gets eliminated again. Samuro is gone. Level 20 ability is a big advantage, of course. Catapults now again at the bottom of the map, going for the next key. Here comes the engage against Taranda. Danazovsky on the run, and he'll still be fine. Gets the stun out against Masquerade, and that's another death on Alarak. He's getting absolutely murdered. So does Kromi. We have five deaths on Samuro, four deaths on Alarak, and now they can just go through the bot lane, take that keep out, and then aim for the core. There are only two defenders left, and I think Mopsio is now also going to fall. It's the end of Garrosh. Only Anduina is still there, and yeah, he can't do anything. That's game. We're going the distance. We're going once again to game number three with Team Masquerade. 
having to be afraid once more that uh, that a weak lead in a series gets turned against them. Nice GG and W by Team Dino as they lock in the victory. Final map, all direct pass. So, ladies and gentlemen, once again, we are going to map number three with Team Masquerade, and I think they are going to be a bit worried about this for a reason, because, let's face it, it could get a bit annoying for them here. If they lose now another series after initially taking the lead, that would be a bit crazy. So, either way, just as a quick reminder, currently we have these bounties still in play. Each team can complete every single bounty one time. So if a team completes a Chogal bounty, it's still open for all the other teams, but a team cannot farm the same, the same bounty over and over again. We haven't seen any bounty attempts in this specific series just yet, but we might of course still get one now that we're heading into all direct pass. Time will tell, but just a quick reminder of what the bounties are. We saw a huge amount of bounties already attempted, some of them completed, not a lot of them. I think specifically when we're going into the group stage and at best of fives, we'll see a few more. But a quick reminder on what the bounties are and what we could still get to see here. Now you have to win with bounties of course as well. If not teams would just throw a map every now and then to get some extra money for themselves. But as we're going into game number three I can already guarantee you that at least for Team Masquerade Victor is going to be absolutely crucial. As I said they haven't won a single series yet so winning it on all drag pass would be important. They went first big first ban, the map was chosen by Team Dino. Now we get Sonia and Johanna right at the beginning. And yeah. <laughs> I'm kinda curious to see what exactly the red team is now doing this time. What their play is going to be. And I still think they're gonna bust out. I, I, I expect them to bust out Vala every single series at least once, if they're allowed to. Now they have Genji and they have Tyriel. So Vala is technically still open for Commander Rex if they wanted to go that path. But I think, I might be wrong on this, but I believe that every time that they played it, they actually had it with a double support. I might be mistaken though. I think in one of the first plays or games where we saw Commander Rex play Vala, he did it with the solo support, so still an option here. But it was always so strong, or at least it felt like it had such a big impact for them that I would have expected them to play it every single series at least one, once. Chen gets banned, so no Panda in this one. Still curious what Commander Rex is gonna pick, Valor or not. And on uh, the left side, of course, the question, what is Dino going to take for the big damage? And the way that they are currently making their picks, if Hyde is still going for the side lane, then either he now gets Sonya after the swap, or what we're gonna get instead is a triple front line for Team Dino. Now, Aldrich is, of course, a map where it's a lot centered around bosses as well. Get Tracer banned out. Yeah, would have been a good one for Dino for sure. And here comes our double pick. That's going to tell us a lot already. Very likely also the support for Danosovsky. Fantastic performance again on Tyrande. Really liked the way that he played it. So, uh, made it work. And now we get Oriel and Cassia. Okay, Aurea is in the house, Cassia gets locked in, that leaves us with Dainu as the final pick and the double pick incoming for Team Masquerade where they have to decide how they're going to round out their draft in order to take it here on Aldrich Pass. So, what can they do? At this point, let's get the double pick in, let's see what Commander Rex is going to uh, play for them. And, well, we're getting... Diva on Gul'dan! Alright. Didn't quite have Diva on my list for this one. Uh, Diva, I'm never sure about the hero. I, I heard that she's high maintenance. <laughs> what a joke. Uh, yeah. Schenkelklopfer. So, all drag pass. Last pick. What do we get for Dainu? They need some more damage. Cassia alone is not going to cut it. Could be a melee, could be ranged. They go for Abatha. And with that, we're getting ready for the final map in the best of three series, ladies and gentlemen. Dino versus Masquerade. It's all drag pass. Game number three. All drag pass is the map. Over on the left, we got Dainu on Cassia. Jaden on Abatha with Hyde playing Sonia. We got Krankel on Joanna. And Danazovsky on Oriel. 
Yeah, specifically Hyde is going to have a fun time with the Abath ahead. Sonya can go absolutely wild if she gets some symbiote support in this. On the right side of the map, Team Masquerade with Mopsio on Teriel, Yazu on Diva. Masquerade, he's playing Genji for the team. Commander Rex on Gul'dan and we have Valar on Lucio. Now one of the questions still to be answered of course, what kind of build we're getting from Gul'dan. And he goes for Echoed Corruption on level 1. No drain build as we've seen now a lot on specifically Tomb of the Spider Queen. We don't have the Fell Flame build which has been uh, pulled out multiple times but instead we're getting old school Gul'dan with Doom's Affliction on 16, with Echoed Corruption on level 1. And yeah, he's going to try and run the show with that during these big team fights as we already have the first one starting up in the middle of the map. A little bridge of death that we're getting here. So far nobody dying, so no uh, quick early kills. But I can honestly not wait to see Sonya with the symbiote just trying to go ham here. This should be pretty fun. At the bottom of the map, Mopsio with Tyriel is currently doing his thing. Abatha sitting over towards the side. And yeah, we've seen our fair share of Abby at this point, specifically on Aldrag Pass. I believe it was on the last play, there were also some out of the action here. With a specific Dino in particular, they really like to play Abatha. They did multiple times already on this map, and I want to see more of this. Abatha is always a lot of fun to watch. I mean, the Slabatha going for the big slaps and the big hits. Who doesn't love that? So, down to the bottom of the map in the meantime, Mopsio. Starting to... <laughs> Nobody's really dealing with him. He's all alone against Abatha here who can work through Symbiote. Later on level 7 we're gonna get Mule for the extra repair. Dainu with Cassia not going into stacks on level 1 but instead getting the charged strikes here. And Sonya after taking the camp now rushing straight into the battle down at the bottom of the map. So Hyde is helping a bit out here. But yeah, pretty... Pretty calm starting the game. I mean, a couple of skirmishes, as you can see right here. Everybody is just sitting at the edges and trying to poke a bit to see if they can maybe get a lucky hit in and get a kill. We have by now also the Ring of Leech for Cassia on level 4, and we're getting uh, the repeated offense by Aurea. So, yeah, who was a bad boy here? Who needs the whip? By now, we got down the bottom of the map, Hyde connecting with Mopsio as he's starting to make his move. And in the meantime, here in the middle, it's still that bridge of death where everybody is just like fighting for it. Crankle moves in up at the front, going for another condemn. Good stacking also from Commander Rex, who's obviously capitalizing on the choke point here and has 16 stacks already on the Echoed Corruption on level 1. If you're completing it around level 16 when you're getting your Runa's Affliction and you're already finding yourself in a decent spot. So, so far, so good. Definitely not a problem here. In the meantime, of course, we're now having uh, the first objective up on the map. The prisoner camps just got located here. And that gives the teams a chance to uh, maybe sneak one in. Uh, Nubaro is banned for the very reason that he can actually do exactly that. That you can very easily sneak in an objective with him if nobody pays attention. By just simply spawning a couple of beetles and making your play there. But in this case, he is not part of the equation. So they have to actually commit to an objective if they want to take it here. And we're already seeing some moves on that. Lucio is just zipping around and trying to shut them down wherever he can right now. Yeah, maybe there's another attack against Dino over here. Not just yet. Haven't seen a single kill yet. And Abatha, of course, is in a spot where as long as there's not too much pressure, Abatha is going to be happy. I mean, right now, Abatha is just waiting for level 10. Then we can get the copy and he can st start to make some moves. I mean, technically, they st still could go for the bounty. If he doesn't go copy, but they go instead for the monstrosity, which I suppose is an option here, then they could get themselves a bounty as well. It is a big map. Monstrosity can be played here. Monstrosity has been attempted here. But if Jaden really goes for it, that's a very, very different question. Now, it is possible. Level 10 will tell, but for now let's just assume that they're going for the more traditional style with Abatha and go for some copy plays. So by now a little bit of damage being done here also as Lucio is moving in again and Danazovsky gets attacked, but so does Lucio. Finds himself the center of attention and gets slowed down. Nice shield from Teriel. Crankle a bit low. Masquerade wants the kill and the heal of Danazovsky barely saves Johanna. No kill for Masquerade. Still not a single kill in this game. 
nobody has been able to lock in a quick one. A bit of a progress over on the blue team's uh, objectives. They are slightly ahead here. We have 20 stacks by now for Gul'dan as everybody is just still sta dancing around and trying to make a little bit of progress happen. But I kind of like it. I mean, they're not really risking anything. Each team is fully aware that this is game three, but there's finally the kill. They come in and they take him out. Damn. Lucio is gone. Easily obliterated. And there's the potential objective for Team Dino. With Lucio as the support gone, they have to just sit back and wait. It's going to be back in five seconds, but it seems from the timer that Team Dino can now grab the first objective and get their set of the cavalry here. Sonia in the middle, on the other hand, gets caught and with Hyde out of the picture, yes, the objective can still be claimed and does barely, but it's 10 seconds until Sonia is back. So they're still poking. The idea was, of course, also to get an additional kill for Team Masquerade, which hasn't worked out for them, but they have the lead in experience, and that translates into an early level 10. That should make the defense easier, and maybe even a kill as they go for Danazovsky. And there it is. Masquerade goes in deep, takes Oriel down. We get the bunny hop for Diva, and that is a very, very easy objective now for Team Masquerade to defend against. Your opponent doesn't have a healer anymore. You have level 10, your opponent doesn't, so they're already starting ahead here. The copy is now in, so we don't get a bounty, unfortunately. We don't get the monstrosity. They're not giving themselves the extra handicap after all of this has happened. And the defense is still ongoing. They're still losing some towers at least, but I think the big threat and the big danger was always that you would lose more, that maybe a fort would get destroyed, and that's just not the case with how quickly they got level 10 and how nicely they played around this and got the kill against Oriel. So, right there, we have them going for Yazu. Frankel gets also hit by the Ford, but no major structures have been destroyed. But each team has a rogue abilities now, and they're starting to make their place for it. Danazovsky getting attacked again. Here comes the copy, double Cassia, as they're trying to make a move. And, oh, Lucio slow and survives. Get nearly taken out by Cassia's ult. Still alive and holds himself way in the back. Taps the Falcon. And they're good to go, at least for now. As Alistair is back down at the bottom of the map and starts to mule things up very quickly again. Of course, in an attempt to make sure that they are not losing even the outer wall. We'll also keep Abasa a lot safer here. No surprises when it comes to ults. Nothing insane taken here. Repeated offense nearly completed now, sitting at four stacks on the level four talent for Aurel. And the camps still getting claimed here pretty regularly by the teams. The mid camp obviously is super important. Can still go for the boss as well. We now got 30,000 damage for Cassia, 18,000 for Genji. And talking Genji, he comes in again from the side. Gets stunned out. Bless Chiel connected with him. But they couldn't get the kill quick enough, uh, quickly enough. So now that means that that's a big cooldown on Joanna's end that got burned for this. So that'd be. Super careful now, engaging into a big battle. Be a bit cautious on this end. Two kills to one, nearly level 13 now. But this is the closest from the three games that we've seen so far, for sure. And there's a lot riding on this. I've been harping about the fact that Team Masquerade hasn't gotten a single match victory yet. If they can pull it off against Dino here, that would be huge. And they really should try. Winning game number one was nice, but they got to do a little bit more than that. And the blue team is massively eager to now lock in a second victory after they just won on the last map. There's level 13 talents now. We're having on top of that also 13 kicking in for the blue team. Objective is of course still up and everybody can start to make a bit of a play now as Abathur's copy gets deleted again, meaning that he's on a 66 second cooldown still. And that is a nice window in which you could try and decide to make a bit of a push. Symbiot is of course still very helpful in these fights, but Abathur not having a copy available is still a bit of a problem. So, yeah. Either way, with that we're now having a poke happening towards the objective. I would have expected them to make more of a move for it, with the copy being down. But they're going for the camp on the right side. Also, Gul'dan has by now reached 30 stacks on his level 1. They're pushing through the middle, hoping to take the fort out. But Abathur is already muling it up. Abathur is coming in with mule, and that is going to help them a lot here. Diva Explosion taking the mule out. Nice, that's one way how to deal with it. 
Diva comes in, explodes on the mule. That's the end of that. Gul'dan under a bit of pressure. 32 stacks for him now. And the attack is still coming right here. With Hyde being pushed back. Masquerade jumping forward with Genji. Hoping to get more damage connected. Dino gets all the symbiote support that he can possibly hope for. But they are, yeah, they're just fighting this out. It's, it's an endless brawl, essentially. We have seen at the 10 minute mark only three kills so far. Not more than that. Teams are very, very cautious to not overextend in these fights, but the blue team is finally starting to make a move for the second objective. It's trying to take these grunts out. There's still some vision here with Jaden, the avatar copy, starting to move towards the top and attacking Gul'dan, but the battle around the prisoner camp is also raging on as Crankle moved towards the front. So, yeah, there's another quick move from Genji as he starts to move in. Masquerade has been poking a lot. And he's being rewarded with 28,000 in damage. Not quite as much as Cassia, but still pretty respectable. They're going for Vala. Lucio, low. Masquerade also still alive. Mopsio has to retreat too. While the red team has taken a lot of damage here, they were still able to get out of the fight. And D.Va is pushing in the middle of the map the entire time. Escorted the minion wave in as well. Is trying to take that fort out. It's not destroyed yet, but they got it insanely low. This is the moment when you're really hoping to deny it to the blue team completely, or not Abathur will just mule it up. Diva gets caught on the other hand, and that's a problem. But while the middle of the map might get muled up, the bottom lane is the next pressure point that the Masquerade aims for. They're destroying the entire wall pretty easily. Masquerade jumping out, gets flanked again, the shield is in! 16 talents are ready for the red team. The blue team doesn't have them yet, but there's still no fight. There's the ult from Tyriel, and Hyde goes down. Nice sanctification allowed them to turn on Sonya and drop her, even with everybody being this low. Three kills to two, and it's a super, super tense game between the two teams. Now, Mule is hard at work in the middle of the map and starting to make sure that this one doesn't die just yet. Martial Law locked in for Cassia now as well, plus the adrenaline boost that will allow them to chase a bit more. Nerves of Steel for Sonya, and big pressure at the top lane too, as the Symbiote of Abertha started to uh, yeah, take some of the minion waves out here. So the fort is in danger, and might even... I don't think it's going to fall just yet, but it's going to take a lot of damage regardless. So as they are still hoping for another kill in the middle, Abatha is pushing the side lanes out with the Symbiote. Doing a great job on this. Diva already with the bunny hop. Gets the explosion out as well, but only zoning them out and allowing them to easily take the camp apart. The leading experience is still in the hands of Team Masquerade. That hasn't changed for a long time now. They're still looking for another five, but look at Mopsio. Mega low. Nearly dying, but also Gul'dan with tons of damage against Dino. Damn, he ate the entire Echo Corruption here. A single stack away from completing his level 1 quest. And then, of course, we're going to get so much more value from Gul'dan in these fights. Runa's Affliction is already locked in. Has been for a level now. So, yeah, he's going to get the full synergy out of all of this. It is tense. It's definitely tense here. And again, the attempt by Team Dino to go for the objective. Dino himself, low, blessed shield comes out, quest completed for Gul'dan, and there's the Horrify, nice dodge by Masquerade, as he's coming in and tries to escape, so Gul'dan and Masquerade are on the same page here, as they are attempting to make sure that Genji does not get murdered, instead they're going for Oriel now, and that's a kill, Oriel is gone just as she completes the repeated offense, quest complete, time to feed. Still applicable, even though this is not one where you lose your progress when you die. They get the kill against Dino, and maybe this was finally the straw that broke, broke the camel's back. Crankle is low, had to retreat. The objective is going to be taken. Diva in the middle was able to take the fort out. Finally, some momentum for the red team. Team Masquerade is taking advantage of the situation, locking in the objective, and trying to make sure that they're finally taking a significant lead in game number three to potentially decide the series in their favor. So yeah, job well done. For now, what we have is all the way up at the top, a push for fort number two. The Raiders are of course going to come in here as well. And specifically the bottom fort is not going to stand a chance. It's easily destroyed. This is going to be gone before the Raiders even make an appearance. So yeah, top side. 
Diva is doing her thing. And now it's just a question of how much more can they get with this pressure play. This is going to be the big one. How much more damage can they do here? This is the huge opportunity for Team Masquerade to now knock at least... I mean, not necessarily a keep down, but at least take some hit points of a few of the keeps. Just get the ball rolling. They destroyed every single fort already, which is obviously big. They have more than a level of an advantage, and level 20 is in their near future. So here's the opportunity to prep for that and really prepare for a potential victory in game number three. And Dino's team is fighting tooth and nail to prevent this from happening. But the wall in the middle got already destroyed. Up at the top, we see a similar picture. The bottom was defeated fairly easily. But right here, another wall is about to fall. And level 20 is starting to kick in, which will allow the red team to go straight for the boss. And that's what they're doing right now. We got Haunt. On top of that, we got the Ablative Armor for D.Va. In addition to that, the Holy Arena, Living Weapon for Genji, and this is looking pretty good. And they're already rotating down to the bottom of the map, anticipating maybe that the blue team is going to try for a boss exchange. Yeah, the rotation is going to be too slow, but while the blue team is busy down here, if they would now move into the middle, they could do some damage on the keep as well. And I think this is going to be the game plan. So they're starting to slowly make a move for this. Yep, and can they take it here? Doesn't seem like they can do too much damage, but even just a bit of poke would help. Stealing the camp would, of course, be nice. And again, they got level 20. They're going for the camp, and in the meantime, the top side keep is going to take damage as well. So, yep, there we go. Damage incoming, middle of the map, it's the same. Gul'dan is gonna say thank you here. If he is able to unleash a couple of combos on that keep, this might be the first major structure to fall. And that's exactly what they're aiming for here. There's Horn. They're hoping for Cassia. Cannot get the kill, it seems. Masquerade zips in, out goes for Aureal. Keep is gone, so that means that the first armor shield is eliminated. And with the second keep now falling, they can technically make a play for the core. Maybe not right now, but now that there's only a single armor shield remaining on the core, that allows you to make plays for it and try to decide the game in your favor. A fort got destroyed at the bottom of the map. The boss is not able to fully break through towards the keep. But still, this is looking very, very good now for Team Masquerade. This is probably their best chance so far to finally take a match win. They just have to make sure that they are not blowing it now. Yeah, good explosion here against the minions, and the boss is going to be taken out by this. Objective is still being fought for, but they're already repelling the invaders as Team Dino has to retreat once again. But yes, a single team fight victory here for Team Asquid would be enough to go for four. And Dino, sanctification is up. There's Aegis. They are trying to get in position for Dino, and he gets fully healed. Nice. Keeping Cassia alive. They're trying to turn the fight now. There's the blessed shield, and Tyriel is dead. Quick whip into the wall. Bye bye, Lucio. And <laughs> I cannot believe it. <laughs> is Team Masquerade again losing on the third map, just as it seems that they are finally gaining some traction in the game. It would be honestly heartbreaking if this follows the same pattern again, but it's kind of the thing these days with them. On level 20, we now have Titan's Revenge, by the way, Hive Mind, obvious choice, and the Radiating Faith for Abatha and Johanna. But with two keeps lost, they're still far behind. But the two heroes that were just killed, that's of course a problem for Team Masquerade. And this is going to be a rough objective to go up against. They're already 18, 19 minutes into the game now. So this is definitely going to hurt. Masquerade talking about him is starting to jump in and apply some pressure on Danazovsky. Not that he's too uh, affected by that. But yeah, here we go. With that, the objective is claimed. That means we're getting uh, the cavalry again. Masquerade already had to jump out again and retreat, which is exactly what he now does. Tyrell is back and so is Lucio. So it's a five-man back up on the map as D.Va is all alone pushing the bottom of the map now. And yeah, this is going to get interesting here. How much damage can the blue team do now? If they can draw even in keeps, then it will essentially come down to a single team fight. So... Whew. This could get nasty real quickly. I kind of feel bad a bit for Team Masquerade as well. If they're losing another series like this, that would be just heartbreaking. <laughs> and something is clearly wrong though, but yeah, at this point they're doing whatever they can. Cavalry is already being defeated in the middle of the map, so at least this one didn't do enough. Yeah, they were able to save that. 
But how much more? What else is possible for them? Masquerade zips out. They're trying to go for a kill, but the defense is strong enough. Now there's two cavalry still on the map. They're all hearthing back, getting mana back, getting hit points back, just doing their thing. But yep, they gotta be mega careful here. And they are. Topside is getting attacked next. I don't think the cavalry at the bottom of the map is gonna be able to do too much. Diva with the explosion is a good one. Creating some space, taking the minions out. Cavalry doesn't stand a chance either. Very solid defense from Team Mask right now. That's exactly what they needed here. So yes, job well done. Nicely done. Down to the bottom of the map now. We get Yazu defending. The Keeper's taking some damage here, which is a bit of a problem, but as long as he don't lose it, it's still fine. Five kills to four. Looking at the damage output, we have 60,000 now for Genji. Look at Cassia, by the way. Cassia is sitting at 110,000. The only one in the six-digit club, and she is nearly doubling what Genji brings to the table here. So Dino is absolutely crushing it with all of the assists that he's getting also, of course, from Abitha. But it's all about the team fights. Boss is up at the top. So technically they can try and make a play for it, which also means that the one at the bottom of the map is going to be up in a few more seconds. So one that they can easily take here. It's also a nice chance to go for a bit of a trap. You could start to just like position up at the top, bait them in, and hope that they are... Ah, oh, blessed shield missing from Krankle. Oh, that sucks. That really sucks. That was a big one. They risked something here. They took a risk and it backfired. If it connects, it's a different story. Diva with a bunny hop. That also didn't do too much for them. So now we have two cooldowns that just got burned. Bosses, as I said, are up. And if any of... If specifically the red team takes one, it's gonna hurt a lot. But as it stands, the attacks, they still keep coming. So once again, they're starting to make a little move for Dino. Attacking Krankle at the same time. Gul'dan is getting nice damage out, specifically against Johanna. She's in a bit of trouble, and Lucio dives in deep, maybe a little bit too deep. Lucio is dead! Lucio committed honorable Sudoku as he went in deep, sat down in the middle of the team fight, and started to solve a math puzzle. So that's an issue, and now it's a five versus four. Oh boy, not like this. No, Diva is down. The next objective is up, and they are jumping on it immediately. Getting immediately for the objective, and boy, oh boy, that's problems brewing. They have an issue, and a big one at that. Lucio getting over eager, trying to stop the opponent, dancing in front of them, blocking them, pushing them back, and then he just gets turned on and killed. Six kills to five now, and they go for a sneaky boss at the top. That's the idea. Go for the sneaky boss top side, and there's a mine from Abatha. They know what's happening. They go for the boss at the bottom of the map, by the way. It's gonna be a bit of a race. They're going for a race here. So Jojo is stopping uh, the grunts from uh, yeah, stopping the objective. This one's gonna be taken. Boss at the top is also gonna be claimed, so they're at least getting that. Boss at the bottom of the map is already moving in. Again, keep in mind, only one armor shield remaining on the boss over here. Over on the right side, every single keep is still standing. This will change now, of course. But they are trying to go for a Hail Mary. They know that the objective is coming. They know that the boss at the bottom of the map is going to take the keep down. So they know they have only one chance. And Dainu pauses the game. What? Tactical pause detected. What is this? A 3-2-3 three three moment. Damn son, talking about shitty pause timings. Johanna disconnected, Crankle disconnected from the game. <gasps> oh boy, yeah, that's bad timing too. Okay, this is a bit insane. Guys, again, this boss takes down the keep 100%. There is no saving this. But the question is, can they end at the top? Because if not, the objective and the boss are likely going to finish it, and they know it too. Team Masquerade is throwing a Hail Mary up at the top. They need to win this one. They know it too, and they're losing Gul'dan within a second. Crankle is coming in with a Blessed Shield and a Condemn, and Gul'dan, one of their biggest damage dealers, is gone right away. That's a disaster already, but the core is getting attacked. Sanctification! It's a race! I don't know if they can win it! The Tyrell explosion could help them a bit here. 10,000 hit points left, and it's just not enough. They're losing too much, and over on the right side, the core is getting attacked. 
Team Masquerade is losing another match. Dinus Team victorious on all direct pass as Team Masquerade is still without a single match win. GG.